So thank you very much. Yeah, so with my topic being how the, and I think we're gonna have some slides. My topic being how the excessive, how excessive wealth disorder hurts the environment. I, I have 60 slides in seven minutes. <laughs> so um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> and so the first slide, um, I guess, do I, do, it, do I advance them or do I tell you? Pardon? Oh, do I advance the slides myself or do I tell you when to advance? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Is there, a, is there a clicker somewhere? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, thank you. So I hopefully they'll grant me those 30 seconds back. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so um, so uh, to quote uh, Spider-Man's uncle, Ben, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And we know that different folks with wealth have uh, different ways of interpreting that. Some do the right thing, like, uh, a couple of people who are in the room and others who are um, who use their wealth in, in, in responsible ways and are, what was the uh, phrase that was used by Barbara, wealth um, traders, what was it? Uh, class traders, thank you. And others, uh, not so much. And so we know how this uh, really has a pretty dire impacts on the environment in terms of some folks who are dominating, thank you, <laughs> dominating our, um, our economy and our political, our political systems. And so there's, these are five factors that hopefully I can read from here, that are linking wealth inequality with the environment, put forward by these uh, uh, Dario Kenner and Richard Dreyer. So the richest 10% spend more, including on indicators of the ecological footprint, including fuel for private jets, as was said before, and or meat and other things. Um, that on average support for strong environmental policies is higher in countries where inequality is lower that inequality is a strong indicator, a driver of consumption, including the, the consumption of the wealthy, but also through status envy and where people are trying to catch up. And that the wealth held by the world's 782 high net worth um, individuals alone could, prov could provide over half of the world population with access to 100% renewable energy by 2030 if we were able to redirect that wealth. And just as a note, in, in many of the privatization scenarios, what is happening in terms of how wealth is being directed is that the primary goal isn't to meet energy water, food, housing, or criminal justice needs. It is to make as much money as possible on the commodities of energy, food, water, um, housing, and incarcerated persons, as I'll illustrate as we go forward. And so this is um, basically 10 illustrative scenarios, and hopefully you can hear, I'm talking like an auctioneer, but again, seven minutes, uh, how, wealth, how in unequal wealth and power are destroying the environment. And so first looking at a historical context, looking images from the Trail of Tears to the, uh, to the reckless extraction of natural resources to this being the 400th anniversary of the transatlantic slave trade, we have this history of rampant in commoditization violent extraction and exploitation of human and natural resources and all of this is institutionalized in our trade policies our manufacturing policies and so forth and so on and so with our energy systems we put out a report this year on April 1st called fossil fueled foolery and it illustrated primer on the top 10 manipulation tactics of the fossil fuel industry. And just to show you a few, we have the, the, the investment in efforts that undermine democracy that is put forth by the industry. We have um, the financing of, oops, sorry, can you go back? Uh -oh. Sorry, you're gonna miss that one. Anyway, the, fi the financing of political campaigns. Uh, we have the funding of scientists and scientific institutions to public biased research studies that say basically the climate change doesn't exist. We have, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe you can go back again, sorry. Fin financing of political campaigns again. Okay, so financing of political campaigns and pressuring politicians, which, we, which we've spoken about. Um, and then we have the, the contending that govern government regulations hurt the economy, ratepayers, and poor people. And so the ways that people have put this across have been very, unfortunately, successful in so many ways, and it's to the detriment of the economy and of our human rights. Then we have denying or understanding the harms that polluting facilities cause to the people and the environment. And if you can see the tagline here, first we have to convince the people that good health isn't everything. <laughs> so these are the kind of, uh, of messages that, we, we, that are kind of un the undercurrents of what we hear every day. Um, deflecting responsibility and shifting blames to the very communities that, that they pollute. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from these polluting folks like, oh, they moved here, like we were just minding our own business, and then this community member moved into, you know, into our cloud of pollution. Um, and, and then pacifying, co-opting, and misrepresenting communities and organizations, trying to buy folks off, trying to, to fool folks into supporting, supporting people, supporting this agenda and being the weapons of our own destruction. 
and then praising false solutions and denouncing real solutions. I never thought I'd be quoting Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I eagerly <laughs> await the administration's regulations protecting pagers, fax machines, and Blockbuster, he said in response to Trump administration um, um, trying to support uh, bringing coal back. And so, and then, uh, yeah, so all the different ways that we do that. <laughs> and so just a few, um, energy inequality by the numbers. Um, Six trillion dollars is the amount of our, of our energy economy. Nine point eight million dollars is the average compensation for, um, for, uh, for coal company CEOs. Thirty-eight thousand, thirty-three thousand eight hundred forty dollars is the average amount that workers make. And a bonus statistic there is that, um, on average, the CEO's compensation is 289 times the rate of the ad average worker. And another bonus uh, is that $2 billion is the amount between 2000, 2000 and 2016 that these companies spent on anti-regulatory, anti-clean energy lobbying. $41 billion is how much African Americans spend on energy every year. 1.1% is the amount of uh, the number, the percentage of African Americans who are working in the energy sector, and less than 0.1% is the um, amount of revenue the African Americans gain from the energy sector. And then $5 is another bonus statistic, is the average wealth of a black woman. And so this really kind of paints a picture of like just the sheer um, impacts of, 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 it, of, or the numbers of energy inequality and then how that actually plays out is another, is a, I'll talk a little bit more in these illustrative scenarios. And so as we know, this kind of agenda, protecting that level of wealth plays out in how we're seeing these kind of images and these kind of policy making in terms of rolling back regulations to protect that, that wealth and, and keep that wealth um, quite centralized. So we put out reports like Fumes Across the Fence Line that really show that communities of color, low-income communities are always, are, tend to be on the, on the front lines of the impacts of the fossil fuel industry. Cold-blooded, putting profits before people, also pointing out that 78% um, of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant. African American children are three to five times more likely to enter in the hospital from an asthma attack, and two to three times more likely to die of an asthma attack. And so these are the types of um, ways that people are more exposed um, to the pollution that comes from this, these money-making industries and the way they're, they're doing their, their money making. This is on the lower left hand is the Cesar Chavez High School, which is in Houston, Texas, which in the oil refinery behind it is one of five oil refiners within a 10 mile radius of that school because they have this pro-business policy that has no zoning, which means that you have this kind of um, zoning of a, of a school right on top of a polluting oil refinery. On the upper right hand corner, we have coal miners. 76,000 coal miners have died of black lung disease since 1968, while the National Mining Association that represents their very employers have fought against the regulations that would have protected them from, from coal mine dust. Meanwhile, they're fighting in the courts. They've actually employed folks from pla places like Hopkins to say in court that when, when people come in and, and, and um, are seeking benefits for black lung, they will say, oh, well, that's not black lung, that's tuberculosis, like this mad rash of, of tuberculosis among um, miners and, and in order to refuse families' benefits. And so this is just more of kind of the same. This is a family in, um, in the Four Corners region and the coal fire power plant behind them is one of four coal fire power plants within a 30 mile, radi a 30 mile radius of where they live, but yet the, they have the two coolers on the porch because they, like 70% of the people on these Navajo lands, do not have electricity or even running water. And so this is really just the height of inequality. All of that electricity that's generated by those coal plants goes to power Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and, um, and Phoenix. And, and doesn't even go to the places who are, g the, the, the communities that are bearing the brunt of the externalities from those report, those, um, those emissions, like asthma, like COPD, like the birth defects that, I don't know if you noticed that one of the persons pictured there was pregnant, that the person might be facing. And so, oops, sorry, can we go back to the other slide? Sorry about that. Um, the other slide is a report we put out last year called Lights Out in the Cold, Reforming Utilities Shut Off Policies as if Human Rights Matter. And in that report, we profiled a number of families, individuals who have actually paid the price of poverty with their lives when their electricity is cut off and they use um, candles to, to light their home and the candles end up burning down their home. When their electricity, get, when their, power, their oil and gas gets cut off and they use space heaters to, to heat their home and then we know space heaters are the number one cause of, of um, 
of home fires. And then this person just last summer, a grandmother who had just paid, end up, uh, was having a hard time paid and her paying and her son paid $200 on the bill, but it didn't catch up in the system quickly enough and they cut off her electricity and she was dependent on a respirator. And that respirator, of course, was run by electricity and so she died. So literally paying the price of poverty with her lives. And meanwhile, people are making $9.8 million a year in, in compensation. So my time is very much up and I have like 30 more stuff. Okay, good. <laughs> can I have a little? Okay, yeah. All right, two more minutes. Awesome. So <laughs> I'll talk even faster. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, with our food systems, when we talk about big egg, we have uh, the terminator seeds, which, again, going against the very laws of nature, the regenerative notion of n nature of, of, um, of nature, um, which, um, which is these terminator seeds, which then go on, which bl fl blow over into farmers' lands, and they're kind of, they have this kind of viral impact on farmers. And Vandana Shiva has done a lot of work on the, the proliferation of um, of suicide now amongst farmers because of the impact of some of these big ag practices. We also know that commercial animal feeding operations, while amassing money for, for these agricultural, for these companies that are, are making money off of meat, are then harming the not only the animals in terms of the inhumane um, conditions that they're working in, but also the, 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 uh, the health impacts, whether it's the methane that's being emitted driving climate change or the communities that are living um, adjacent to these um, situations. And then, and then uh, again, with the uh, people being more likely to, to ha access the negative impacts of the of food production, also less likely to actually access um, healthy and nutritious foods. They they talk about communities being food deserts, but the communities that are in those conditions don't actually like the term food deserts because deserts implies something that happens naturally. And they know that whether it's redlining or gentrification and displacement or all these different ways that they're intentionally separated from resources, so they prefer, prefer terms like food apartheid and so forth that actually name what's actually going on. Um, I, one of my friends who lives in the D.C. area who's a white American, she, came, she to, told me that her son came home from school one day and he said, um, Mom, why are all the black kids rich? And she's like, well, what makes you think that, Milo? And he said, well, the, you know, I, I just have carrots and celery in my lunch and they have Doritos and Cheetos and Taquitos. <laughs> and so I'm like, there's so much wrong with that statement. But we, but we both kind of analyzed because she's a labor organizer as well and um, just analyzed what that actually, what all went into that comment. And so we talk about our water systems. We all know that the trifecta of the Flint water crisis wasn't just about poisoned water. It was about p water that was poisoned by legacy, um, um, legacy pollution from industry that was unregulated because of of the influence of, of uh, these polluters over our political economy. And then the disinvestment, once, fl once Flint kind of had, w had worn out its um, usefulness to these communities that pulled out en masse and, and, and pulled out hundreds of thousands of jobs from Flint that left it in the situation where they, um, where they were vulnerable to having their dis democracy dis displaced. And we see that kind, of th that kind of situation that kind of plays out time and time again, like the Red Dog Mine in the Alaska area, which has violated the Clean Air Clean Water Act 600 times, and yet it continues to operate. And yet we have people who, g again, get caught off from electricity because they lo lose a couple of, 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 of payments. So again, I could go on and on because there's about 20 slides left. But uh, just to wrap up, um, because our time is short, just a th the, the, these are just a couple more talking about Halliburton that actually sought an exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act. The notion that someone can even apply for an exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act lets us know what's wrong with our political um, system <laughs> in and of itself. And so, in the end, we talk about some of the other um, uh, disparities in the ways that the com companies hold sway over that, that are driving the, um, the climate cl crisis, which again, you know, hopefully you'll have access to this so you can see some of this yourself. But um, in the very last slide is, oh well, before that, this is just one um, quote when we talk about the U.S. being 4% of the global population but 25% of the emissions that drive climate change and yet we have these punitive migration, immigration policies and this is a quote from Warsan Shire, a Kenyan-born Somali poet. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. So these are just 10 policy solutions that I put forward and of course the last one is tax the super wealthy and that's my contact information. Thank you. <laughs>